Hi there! Bear with me while I start with something simple to understand and extremely basic to most. That's because some people are extra stubborn and or lack common sense. So I must explain. First, natural fathers and sons are the closest that two males can be from a biological standpoint. That is, with the rare exception of identical twins who share identical DNA. And ideally, natural fathers and sons should be the closest that two males are relationship-wise. Therefore, the Bible uses numerous father-son illustrations to make a spiritual point. First, some dispute the claim that Jesus was God by arguing that he was never called God, he was only called the Son of God. But it's common knowledge that sons are only temporarily lesser than their fathers, and only in some ways. As male underage children temporarily lack equal rights to their fathers because they lack maturity, Jesus was under his father's authority because he temporarily reduced himself to the human condition. When male children are adults, they equal their fathers origin-wise, physically, mentally, and rights-wise. The original John Smith does not permanently stand superior to John Smith Jr., and John Smith Jr. does not permanently stand superior to John Smith III, etc. They all attain exact equality. So after Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, conquered death, and ascended to his Father, he was equal, also God. Notice the prophecy in Isaiah 9-6 that preconceives Christ as Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Not multiple gods, but an indivisible triune God, as a triangle is simultaneously three but one. Now, there are multiple types of fathers and sons. Jesus being the Son of God, singular, shows a unique father-son relationship, the closest possible, both genetic-wise and relationship-wise, thus completely unbreakable. All other father-son relationships are breakable somehow. Satan is certainly God's son on basis of origin, but the loving relationship and fellowship aspect was completely destroyed. Now, a preacher said that he thinks saved men, sometimes called sons of God, cannot lose their salvation because his sons could never stop being his actual sons, no matter how they misbehave. What he fails to realize is that God has only one natural son in that sense, Jesus Christ. Believers are not even adopted children at this point. Here's proof. Romans 8.23 Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fr fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. This life is just a testing period for the Lord to decide whether or not to adopt believers. Believing on Christ is just a minimum consideration for adoption. All adoptions will be Christ's resurrection of people's bodies along with their spirits. Not before! So not only does this refute once saved, always saved, it refutes the idea of immediate heaven for Christians after death. St. Irenaeus in AD 180 wrote, Those who do not obey him, being disinherited by him, have ceased to be his sons. Irenaeus, who lived from AD 130 to 202, was a bishop primarily noted for the development of Christian theology by combating heresy and defining orthodoxy. He was an immediate disciple of Bishop Polycarp, who was an immediate disciple of the Apostle John. Besides, I've written a WordPress dissertation titled Perseverance of the Saints, or Once Saved, Always Saved, which refutes that idea with 82 scripture references and many explanations. If you hold to that doctrine, read it! For those who don't, beware of those who pervert the gospel of Christ. Read Galatians 1, 6-9. The Bible uses analogies, comparisons between two things that help explain or clarify. But analogies are necessarily imperfect and ill-fitting, useful though they are. So the preacher trying to make God's relationship with believers exactly like his relationship with his sons is ignorance. His doctrine is rooted in dishonesty and will send souls to... 
Besides, let's examine the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, 11 to 32. In it, Jesus used an illustration of a literal father and his sons to make a spiritual point. One son succumbs to temptation, departs from his father's house, and falls to serious sin. But then from his own volition, he repents and returns to his father's house. Now notice the climax in verse 32. Thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Think about how he was dead. He obviously was not physically dead, and not, as the expression goes, you're dead to me. There is only one other option. He was dead in trespasses and sins. So a point that Christ made is that saved so-called sons in their father's house can become lost. The confused preacher I mentioned before realizes that a Christian can fall away into serious sin as this parable teaches. However, he believes the Holy Spirit would never allow any such person to remain in that state and would eventually compel them to return to Christ. Just be, just because that can be true in certain cases in no way makes it the rule. That being the rule is not found in the Bible. It is not only false, it is dangerous. That's because it engenders fellow Christians' neglect of those who fell into serious sin. See Jude verses 22 to 23. Romans chapter 11 makes it clear that Christians are quote-unquote wild olive branches grafted in contrary to nature into God's family. In other words, they are not the natural children, only adopted. And the grafts have not healed and fused, so to speak, so they are not yet permanent. This will be decided at the judgment when Christ returns. Some ignorant people isolate the first part of Romans 11.26 out of context to make it teach Israel's unconditional salvation. But all Israel shall be saved. How? Only one way, through the, the Deliverer, Jesus Christ. And only if they continue in his goodness, otherwise they will be cut off from salvation. It can't mean anything else. Another type of fathers and sons is that of older mentoring Christians and younger believers. But that subject is for another time.